name is Bear Siragusa, and you are listening to the Hunting Hound Podcast presented by W Hunting Supply. All right. Well, I feel like I start every podcast by saying all right, but usually we've talked for a little while and and stuff like that. But tonight, I am sitting here uh, talking to uh, Cuba. Is it Bronowicki? Is that how you pronounce your last name? Yeah, that's how most people Close. said it in Canada. Close enough. Okay. Yeah. How uh, how would you say your name? In Polish? Yeah. Bronowicki. Bronowicki. Okay. That's not, that's not bad. Hmm. Yeah, it's the typical ski in the end of the Polish last names. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you... Cuba is actually a, it's a short form for, let's say, Jake. Uh, you would translate it as Jacob. Really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's what I've got in the papers, actually, too. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Were you now... Tell me a little bit uh, about yourself. You know, I, you and I have talked for years, but um, but tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, uh, I've spent about half of my life in Canada and half of it in Poland with different time periods here and there. Mm-hmm. But I'm currently living in Poland. Uh, I've got into hunting and hounds. Recently, within the past two years, mm-hmm. it's something that always interest me, interested me since, uh, since I was a little kid. And I've always wanted to have a dog. And I've always lived in uh, a rural area where there was always access to the forest. So it was only natural. But I've never had uh, any family members or, or friends who were actually hunters. Mm-hmm. So it was just uh, something that... I've always wanted to do. And since uh, I finally moved permanently to Poland, I've decided to give it a shot since I was, since I finished uh, school and started my, started working, became more independent. I decided to, uh, to do, to do what I wanted to do since since I was a kid. Uh, So I started the system here in Poland is, compared to the US is a little different. Okay. Uh, where before you become a full pledged hunter, you have to go through this lengthy process, like in many other European countries, mm-hmm. that will uh, allow you to be a hunter. Uh, so I've started that two years ago. First, you have this one year long internship or apprenticeship where you try to, where you first apply to a local hunting club, uh, club and um, you hope they accept you after you, well, send in your CV mm-hmm. and they uh, <clears throat> invite you for an interview. And if it's, if it's a positive result, they invite you for this year long internship where you uh, get to meet all the other members of the hunting club uh, that, uh, works in, in your local area here. Okay. Uh, you get to participate in the clubs, let's say life where they manage the game and they do all sorts of activities, uh, for conservation, uh, within their management area, the hunting lease. Okay. Uh, and after that one year, they either approve you or if they don't if you know if they you didn't meet their expectations or uh they don't really see you as a member of the club but mm-hmm. i managed to pass okay after that you have to pass your well first you have to do a course that's about four weekends okay. after this course there is an exam the exam has uh, three sections you have a written test you have an oral test and then there is a shooting test okay so you have to pass all of those 
And after that, you become a, an official member of the Polish National Hunters Association. But uh, you're you're not a member of any club yet. You're just you just have the papers to be able to to hunt. But to be able to actually go on a hunt, you have to be a member of a hunting club. Or be, if there is one way where you uh, can get invited, but you don't have to be a member. But if you know someone who can invite you for okay. just a single hunt, they can, you know, on an invitation basis, you can hunt, but you can go out whenever you feel like it. Okay. The but only do way you have you can do to, that is if can you, I ask a couple questions real quick before we get farther away? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Shoot. When you have to do this uh, sort of application process, is that for a hunting club or is that for? Is that for some, like the internship process? Well, first you apply for the internship. So you have to find, you have to do the internship at a local hunting club and you apply to them. So you send in your request, your CV, or more like a personal statement where you just kind of talk about why you want to uh, become a hunter and uh, do this internship. Yep. And uh, they have to approve you. Uh, and take you in for this one year long process. If you're having trouble with that, for example, for some reason, you've applied to many local hunting clubs in your area, and I don't know, they don't want to take you in. Uh, a secondary option is you apply to the, let's say, like the regional office or the regional uh, director of of, of the hunting clubs in the area yep. and they have to because and they have to um, send you for this internship to one of their um, it's called an OHZ. it's like a, um, it's like some of the best or some of the primary hunting grounds are managed by by these higher up uh, offices or okay. usually associated with the forestry uh, service. Mm -hmm. So they send you in to, to do this internship within one of those, uh, one of those regions that they manage. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not the best option because uh, it's always better if you get into one of the local hunting clubs because it's, in the end uh, you want to, you know, show yourself and meet the people uh, here where you will be after this whole process and after the exams applying to to be able to hunt on the right. lease that they manage. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, then you take this uh, four weekend course and then you have to reapply to, to get into these clubs or can you take the course and just continue with the club that maybe you were asked to be a part of after the year? How does that work? So the internship, it's just one part of the whole process. So after you finish that, you basically have the right to apply for the course and do the exam. But uh, it's like the, the club approves your internship and you're done with them, basically. Like after that, after your full-fledged hunter, you have to reapply, like you said. Okay. Uh, but you're not applying for the internship. You're reapplying to be a hunter, to be a member of the, let's say, local chapter of the local hunting club here. Okay, gotcha. Yep, that's what I was curious about. Cool. So what when you went through that process, what made you... Why did you choose a hound instead of, you know, a, a bird dog? You know, people, I think a lot of people think of Europe and they think definitely more, you know, spaniels, um, you know, pointing, you know, pointers, German wire hair, draw tars, things like that. What made you not do that and choose to go for a hound instead? Well, first, I'd like to mention that I really got into hunting because of the dogs. Mm -hmm. Like I said, since I was a kid, my dream, was, my dream was to have a dog and the hunting was the additional part or it's something that interested in me, uh, you know, with the dog, to do it with the dog. 
So during my internship, I actually got a hound. So even before I became a hunter, I already had a hunting dog and I was planning my hunting future with the dog in mind. Okay. <laughs> and I chose a hound. Well, first of all, it's after doing a lot of research while still even before applying for the internship. Uh, usually, uh, I was still living in Canada. I was looking up uh, some of the coon hound breeds or the plot hounds. And it really just stuck with me the way um, hunting with hounds worked. Yep. But one of the biggest reasons is uh, you got to choose a dog for the hunting lease that you have or for the game that is within your management region. So uh, here where we hunt in the Sudeten Forland or the big, just, or just at the northern tip of the Sudeten Mountains, uh, what we really uh, have in our uh, hunting lease are wild boar, roe deer, and the transient population of red deer. There's not a lot of uh, small game. We do have pheasants, we do have hares, but not that much. And it's all got to do with uh, the fact that in the 70s or 80s, where the situation was totally reversed in the entirety of Poland, there was a huge surplus of small game. There were tons of hares, tons of pheasants. Uh, and that was to do with the way mostly agriculture back then worked, that the okay. uh, fields were much smaller in area. There was much more variety in the types of uh, crops that people grew. And the, these small fields were cut up with uh, these uh, little forests and bushes and, and uh, river streams. So it was a very good habitat for, for small game. Mm -hmm. But with the coming of uh, more advanced agricultural techniques and the monocultural huge fields of corn and canola and wheat, mm -hmm. the habitat for small game really got ruined. But uh, it was a really good uh, food source for the for the big game. So wild boars and deer species. Sure. And the population grew, whereas the small game population declined. So right now we have a, uh, like I said, we mostly hunt a wild boar and roe deer and mm -hmm. red deer. Okay. So a hound was a perfect choice to uh, either for an individual hunt, because we can do individual hunts uh, with a dog or in the fall and winter season, uh, driven hunts are also mainly focused on red deer and wild boar so it's also uh where hounds shine sure so naturally a hound was a good choice for me okay <laughs> or so Is i it... figured because <laughs> it's always that your first hound really teaches you more than you can teach him but it was a good choice right that's cool okay is there is there like a here in norway we've got like a height limit for you know roe deer uh uh uh, hounds that can hunt roe deer need to be, you know, so and so small. Is there anything like that there? Is that is that what sort of distinguishes or determines what kind of hound you're going to use on these driven hunts, or is that more of just a, a cultural thing? How is how does that work? No, well, there's no height limit, but you we've got a limit on what we can hunt actually. So roe deer, unfortunately, uh, you're not able to hunt them with a dog, or you're not allowed to do it yep. sometimes obviously in driven hunts where the pack of dogs pushes through a, a region they can push out roe deer mm -hmm. and they sometimes do get shot but the only species you can hunt with a dog officially and legally are wild boar red deer and predators so foxes uh, raccoon dogs right. and these sort of uh, species Right for so uh, for the listeners who don't know, there's a 
is a small type of canine in um, parts of Europe that that is colored very similarly to a uh, a raccoon, and that's what you're referring to as the raccoon dog. Um, yeah, exactly. Those are uh, those are cool little dogs, and you guys actually are getting some. Um, which part of Poland do you live in? Like where where are you situated? I live in the southwestern part of Poland, like I said, just on the edge of the Sudeten Mountains. So everything north of us are flatlands, and the closest biggest city is Wrocław. Uh, south of us is are the Sudeten Mountains, or the main the main mountain range, and we border with Czech Republic. Okay, gotcha. And you guys are getting some interesting species kind of moving in on you guys, on you in recent, yeah, really just kind of recent months. Yeah, we've got uh, a very dynamic situation with, uh, interestingly enough, uh, raccoons, yep. which are coming in by the by the drove from uh, from Germany. Uh, right now, they've settled pretty much. Uh, the entirety of the Oder River, which is the the river, is basically the border with uh, Germany. So they they've settled the the banks and the forests surrounding the river well, a few years back, but they've been steadily and very quickly expanding eastward. So uh, I just yesterday I sent you a picture of the first raccoon track I've seen in. In our area, yeah, but I've, cool. I've had signals. Yeah, I've had signals, and I've seen uh, some of my friends who hunt in adjacent uh, leases. They've sent me pictures of uh, raccoons that they've already shot. So I already knew they were here. It's yep. just we in my hunting club, nobody uh, got the chance to uh, to hunt one. But maybe we're just not used to looking up on trees yet. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's that's really cool though. Are the raccoons are those native species to Europe or is that something that was imported? How did they how did they get there? Uh, from some of the literature I studied, um, it's a it's a leftover from the fur trade or at least they tried to they've imported uh, raccoons to mostly Germany where they uh, wanted to uh, breed them or have them for their fur to later sell it. But uh, during World War II, there were a few cases where some of the bigger, uh, bigger uh, places where they were held uh, got destroyed and they ran off into the environment. And other times there were just simple cases where they escaped or were just... Uh, not uh, it didn't work out so people would release them and since they're a very adaptable animal they've uh, they've adapted and their population has grew a lot and they've established themselves uh, here in europe mm -hmm. uh, something uh, that i've some statistics that i've looked up uh, not too long ago was uh, in the early 2000s, so about 20 years ago, in Germany, in all of Germany, they've shot uh, around 2,000 raccoons. And now, just uh, last year, they've shot over 100,000 a year. Wow. wow. So, and uh, from the same uh, year that they've shot 100,000 in Poland, They've shot around 2,000. So thinking, <laughs> looking uh, at the statistics, maybe in, in 20 years we'll also be having uh, such a huge population. Although seeing how much or how fast they're expanding, it might be actually even earlier. Right. Wow, that's crazy. That's crazy that they've established themselves that quickly there. Because I mean, like yeah, realistically, it's, uh, it's, that's uh, that's a, that's crazy. Because I mean, that's to establish themselves 
I mean, even even say a hundred years has gone by. That's still just shocking that there's that many of them there just from, you know, escaping from fur farms. That's that's really that's really interesting. So do you yeah, have a, a, a coon hound? What what kind of what kind of hound do you have? Well, I have a two year old Polish hunting dog. That's what the that's what the English uh, translation is. Okay. Or a Polish sight, uh, Polish scent hound, Polish hunting dog. It's a it's a medium sized hound, usually black and tan. Can be also chocolate or or red, but mm-hmm. those are very very rare. Uh, they're they're very uh, athletic in a sense uh, that they're very uh, kind of lean, athletic looking dogs. Uh, Compared to, for example, the Polish hound, which is another breed of hound native to, to Poland, but uh, it's very similar to to the Russian hound that you have, and I believe the they have they are uh, probably of the same stock because the Polish hounds originated from what is now uh, Belarus, and okay. I know in Belarus and Russia and in Poland. Uh, these types of dogs are used in the Polish hound. And Polish hounds are uh, much heavier. Mm, they, they're not so lean and they're a little bit bigger. They're, they're like closer to, let's say, a bloodhound, but not as heavy as a bloodhound. Uh, I've decided on a Polish hunting dog. Uh, like I said, I didn't have anyone to introduce me. So I was doing all of my research on my own reading, uh, talking to people, watching some different uh, videos and materials. Mm-hmm. I've decided on a Polish hunting dog because uh, I figured that even though they're smaller, uh, the athletic built and lighter weight would probably be more beneficial than uh, than the heavier built uh, Polish hound. Yep. And especially taking into consideration uh, the place where they originated from. Like I said, Polish hound originated from the, well, back then Polish, but now in Belarus lowlands, the forest in, in Belarus, which is really flat. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Polish hunting dog originated from the southeastern part of Poland, which is uh, where the Carpathian Mountains are present. So it was a typical mountain dog. It was a little bit shorter, much lighter, also built for stamina and speed. And that's something I was looking for in a dog, especially since here we also live uh, within the Sudeten Mountain Range and some of the thickets and the hilly area here where the dogs uh, are chasing uh, a very dangerous game which is wild boar i I, th- I thought it would be beneficial to have a lighter faster more agile dog right yeah i think that that uh that sounds like sound reasoning to me yeah for sure so um, but to be fair the polish hounds although bigger heavier they also do quite well even in the mountains they're a little bit less popular now but there are some very dedicated people who are working on uh, making the breed uh, more popular and especially uh, making the breed once again be popular among hunters. So it would be a working, it is a working breed. Uh, That's, uh, that's also a very good, very good hound. Yeah. Okay, cool. Wow. There's a lot. um, It always fascinates me. You know, you think of when people hear hound, they think automatically of the United States and, and, you know, you get the sort of picture of, you know, most people get the picture of a, a walker or a blue tick or a red bone or something like that. But, you know, it's fascinating to me having kind of gotten into it a little bit over here, how many hound breeds there are in mainland Europe. It's, it's there's, I think about every country has their own breed of hound, which is really cool. Yeah, it's cool. It's very cool. Um, 
sometimes the breeds are very similar and it's a matter of uh, i think a little bit uh, of nationalism that's why every country has its own breed although um, geographically the countries are close and the breeds look similar for example like um, the polish hunting dog looks very similar to the slovakian kopov or the slovakian hound right um, the polish hound looks very similar to the uh you know russian hound that that you have mm-hmm. but uh yeah it's the the history and the variety of breeds present in europe is definitely associated with the history of European countries, even the Polish breeds, which we have currently, I would say five and a half. And I'll get to the point why a half. We have the um, Polish uh, lowland sheepdog, the Polish tetra sheepdog. So two shepherd breeds. We have the Polish uh, greyhound, which uh, for some reason, you have to have a special uh, permission to breed it or to own that breed. And really, wow. the breed is a hunting dog, but par forest hunting in Poland is illegal. So Polish uh, greyhounds are not work are not a working breed anymore, which is very sad. You have the Polish hunting dog, which I own. Mm-hmm. You have the heavier Polish hound, which both have. Very interesting histories because, of course, like I said, history matters. World War II nearly, where Poland was occupied, nearly destroyed the uh, the two breeds that they went extinct almost. Yeah. But luckily, uh, there were two colonels, actually. One that was originally from where Belarus is now, when it was still Poland, before the partition. And one from the Bieszczady Mountains, which is part of the Carpathian Range in the southeast. And the one, both of them were breeding their own hounds. One was the lighter type and one was the heavier type. In 1964, actually, the International Kennel Federation or the, the uh, actually registered the Polish hound, the heavier one. Okay. But the Polish hunting dog was actually registered with the Polish hound because they were treated as the same, although physically and the way they hunted was very different, but they were treated for some reason uh, uh, as the same breed. But after a few years where uh, breeding between them wasn't really working out and it was really obvious that those two types of dogs are just different breeds, they finally, uh, they finally registered very late, uh, very late. The Polish hunting dog as a separate breed, but okay. they were saved by these two colonels who were hunters and who uh, saved the breeds from extinction because they they loved the dogs and they bred them. And the last one is a very it's a modern breed that someone tried to uh, kind of bring back to life because in the 18th and 19th century, um, like you said, Spaniels and pointers were are popular in Europe. So some of the nobles also had these Spaniels. And after a bunch of years, you know, back then in medieval times or even like 18th century, 19th century, mm-hmm. the, the dogs that did the job, they were interbred. And this sort of local Spaniel breed was, uh, was made that went really uh, extinct after World War II. But uh, there was this gentleman who, in modern times, went around some of the old Polish lands in Belarus and Lithuania and found the these Spaniel dogs that were in the type, that they were the type of, uh, they looked like those dogs from the past that were Polish Spaniels. Mm-hmm. And he started breeding them again, and they are in this early phase of acceptance by this uh, international kennel federation. So there is a Polish hunting spaniel that is currently being, let's say, refined or brought back to life. Uh, Sure. So we have these breeds. Wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's, it's amazing to me that some people do that. 
you know, we've got similar things with the, with the Huskies as well, with people who have sort of found historical references to a type of dog and have been in now in the process for several years of trying to recreate that breed. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting prospect. I don't know. I honestly don't know it totally takes how I feel amount. about it. It takes such a huge amount of work. And even, even if you do it, I, I I'm skeptical to the, whether the breed is going to actually be the same as what you're trying to recreate. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. It might be a little bit different with something that's actually been around, um, you know, within living memory, you know, um, or, you know, within documented history, you know, it's not just some random, you know, reference to something from medieval times, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. I mean, you can't be certain that's going to be exactly as it was, or even if there was an exact standard back then, but it definitely takes a huge amount of dedication. Um, but funny enough, I remember in the last episode, you were, you talked with uh, Bob Plot, mm -hmm. by the way, great guy. I'd love to meet him one day or go to Plot Fest. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> but it's, be funny really cool that, uh, it's funny that it's uh, funny that you guys talked about. I believe you are having some trouble with uh, registering your uh, your new plot hound within the Norwegian Kennel Club because even sometimes you said that although the plot hounds have like 200 years of history and true, they descend from the Bavarian mountain hounds, but you've had some trouble because uh, the kennel club treated them as sort of a mixed breed. <laughs> yeah. That's been the darndest thing is that, you know, I, I have genetics, uh, on this pup that go back, you know, as basically as far as you would want to trace them, you know, back to the, you know, the early 1900s, late 1800s, you know, so ge many, 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 many generations of dogs and, um, you know, the dogs that he goes back to were amongst the first ones registered in the AKC, um, back in the day. And yeah, they just, uh, for whatever reason, Norway has decided that the Norwegian Kennel Club has decided that, um, they are going to, yeah, be different from everybody, everybody else, uh, or, you know, most of the bigger kennel clubs. So, you know, they'll, they'll go to, you know, they, they can end up in a scent hound category and be competing against breeds that they don't recognize as breeds, which is if they go into international, you know, um, uh, whatever you call them, pageants, shows, which to me is absurd. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you've got a lot of these small small breeds of dogs or, you know, the like local breeds of dogs that it can get, it can be really, really difficult to get them, to get them <sighs> registered in these different kennel clubs because, you know, like if you're the American kennel club, why, why would you have any interest in, you know, registering the, you know, three Baracks, for example, that are in the United States. There's no point, you know, but here in Norway where you've got, you're starting to get, you know, there's a lot of people now who have um, walkers and blue ticks and America, especially American foxhounds are, there's quite a few of those over here and none of the hound breeds, um, none of the American hound breeds are, are recognized over here as legitimate breeds. Yeah, for me, it's also absurd, especially that even for the International Kennel uh, Federation, uh, like the Polish hound was in a very dire situation in terms of the genetic makeup because there were not that many uh, individuals to continue uh, the breeding. So as a fun fact, uh, 
there is a program uh, that's official mm -hmm. uh, where they've added uh, black and tan coonhound blood to the Polish hound to give some more genetic variety. Right. And uh, same with the Polish hunting spaniel. It's such a work in pro progress in, in its infancy where they've actually have to add in some other spaniel, official spaniel breeds to, to mix it up and uh, have a healthy breed in the future. So even within these official international organizations, you have uh, these programs that allow for some mixing in. And here where you have a breed that's established for so many years, they uh, give issues because I don't know why it's 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 an issue with many of the American breeds. Yeah, it's... the only one that's actually registered within the International Kennel Club is the Black and Tan Coonhound. The rest of them are not recognized. That's cr that's so crazy to me. That's just so crazy to me that that's that that's the case. You know, it's it's. Yeah, man, that's that's so insane. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and it's you know the 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 thing about it is that it's if they were consistent, then I wouldn't have an issue with it. Like it would irritate me, and I would probably or that, that's not true. I it would still irritate me, but if they were like if they were consistent with every breed, that there were a consistent set of you know circumstances and a consistent set of documentation that they would need to be registered or recognized as a breed, then I wouldn't have any real issue with it. I would understand it, at least understand the reasoning. What flabbergasts me about this whole thing right now is that nobody can give me a good reason why. It's just like, well, that's always how it's been. And it's like, well, that's not, that's not really a reason. It's, you know, the, that, well, the plot hound is not registered, recognized as a breed here because it's, never been recognized as a breed here. It's like, it's a, it's a non-answer. Um, so it's, I, I, and especially when you've got the, like you say, you know, the, the Polish Spaniel and the Polish, um, the Polish hound and, you know, here in Norway, you've got the, the Dunker and the Hugen hound and the Hamilton hound and the Halden hound where all of, all of those breeds have brought in other hounds to freshen up the genetics so you have ha like documented half breeds that are registered as something they're re you know registered um dunkers that are half finnish hound which then it just it just gets too stupid to me like i i understand why you would want to freshen up the blood and i think that those dogs you know, absolutely can be registered as, as the original thing, but you know, you can't say that and then be like, but your dog with 200 years of documentation, no, I'm sorry. Your dog is a, is your dog's, you know, grandfather to the 10th power was a mixed breed from the mountains of Germany. So we're sorry. It just, it makes no sense to me. Yeah, me neither. It's it's a shame. It's a shame for uh, it's a detriment for the breed, and it's a you know it's a problem for the handlers who are interested in them because uh, up until recently you're not allowed to participate in any official competitions unless you here in Poland obviously unless your um, breed that you're running is registered within the international federation. Okay. So. Yep. Wow. That's, that's crazy to me. So apart from, I, I guess we'll move on from the bureaucratic frustration <laughs> over the bureaucratic stuff. Tell me a little bit about, uh, tell me about your hound. What are, what are you doing with him? Are you hunting, are you hunting wild boar? Are you hunting fox? Are you, well, like, what are, what are you hope mostly focusing on with him? So, uh, like I've said, it's a little little bit of a different system than, or a much different system. I don't know how it is in Nor Norway, but definitely different than in America um, because of the lack of uh, public land or because of the fact that in Europe, the 
population density is so high. Uh, here in Poland, the whole country is divided into these hunting leases, leases that the different uh, hunting clubs lease from the government. So we're always, uh, we are only allowed to hunt within our lease unless we get invited uh, to a different one for just one outing. So like I said, what we have here in my hunting lease are yep. wild boar, roe deer, and red deer. What I'm doing, because the season for hunting with a dog is from August 15th until the end of January, uh, what I do when, or what I'm going to try to do, because uh, for now I've been training my dog, like I said, he's going to be two years old, and I've just got my uh, hunting permission and I, I was accepted as a member of the local hunting club just this past November. Okay. So wow. until I'm waiting for the next season, but what I plan to do is do a lot of individual hunting with him. So we will go out on our revere mm -hmm. and uh, just plan to uh, run some wild boar and hopefully he will, you know, cold trail eventually find the boar, bay them up, uh, make them stay in one place, and we'll be able to, uh, to, to, to hunt them. That's, a, that's the plan. And, and what, I want, what I'm doing in preparation for that is, uh, well, in 2018, there was a very bad uh, law that passed that this allowed hog pens or training with wild animals in Poland. And as well, this allowed kids or everyone under 18 participating in hunting, which was a huge blow. Mm -hmm. But since we're not allowed to train with uh, wild and with live animals, which includes wild boars in a, in a pen fenced in area. Okay. I plan to visit uh, Slovakia, which is, uh, uh still where it's still allowed uh, for this to happen so i plan to take my dog into this uh, wild boar pen so he has contact with a boar in a rather safe environment and he can uh, gain some experience for the upcoming season sure and uh, the other activity that we're focusing on is blood tracking it's a useful skill to have when you're out hunting individually, even if you're out hunting for roe deer without a dog and you happen to wound game and you need to find it, it's good to have a dog that's uh, able to help you localize the, uh, the game. So we've been practicing a lot, laying different uh, blood tracks uh, at least once a week and doing various difficulties changing up the length, changing up the amount of uh, turns you do. Mm -hmm. And we've been practicing hard blood tracking in the off-season as, as an off-season activity as well to, to keep them fit and mentally uh, mentally like active. Yeah, okay. We were, last year, we were able to even participate in, a, in an international comp in two competitions, actually. Once, we didn't do so well. Uh, where we had the unfortunate uh, meeting with a judge that uh, really blew our sp sp spirits. Yeah, you told <laughs> Although me about that. I think that, the that, did that a good was, job. <laughs> that was uh, that was unfortunate. You guys, you guys got stuck with a, you know, excuse me, but complete shithead. <laughs> he just he yeah, just he messed was. you guys. <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, he messed you guys up big time and. Yeah, it was super critical about you and and your hound. And I remember you talked, we talked right afterwards. And I was just like, geez, just do not, I, don't, don't listen to this guy. It's just like, what a, what a jerk. Yeah, he really put us down. I think, uh, especially for a new, uh, a new member to the sport. Uh, I don't think he, uh, he did anyone a service, uh, uh, with his attitude uh, but uh, we continued training we got back from it and we mm, took part in 
an international competition that was held here in Poland, but it, it was it had international status. And uh, we actually did, we were judged, uh, we got second place. Uh, I was able to get an extra award for being the best handler during the competition. And it was, it was uh, great to, to hear that the time and effort we've put in and what we're doing is, is in the right direction. So, oh, of course we were, yeah, it was a, it's a good day. And so other than, uh, other than, other than actually training blood tracking, we, this year, uh, we also plans to participate in uh, different uh, competitions for blood tracking, as well as later on in the season, uh, you can do a competition during a, a natural hunt that a judge will also award you a certificate or will judge you uh, on the dog's uh, work on an individual hunt on wild boar. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, there is a big discourse between the Polish Hunting Association and the Polish Kennel Club that happened at the beginning of the year. And all competitions are currently canceled. And that uh, ruined that part of our uh part of our plan for uh, preparing for the season. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. What is the conflict about? Um, well, <laughs> you know, when you when it really boils down to is is money. Okay. Um, yeah. the Polish Hunting Association when these competitions were organized always by the by the hunting association. So they, they invited the, the judges, they paid for the judges, they laid down the tracks or they prepared the scene for the, uh, for the driven hunt uh, or the natural hunt uh, competitions. Mm-hmm. They've put in all the effort, but the Polish Kennel Club, which is the representative of the International Federation, Kennel Federation here in Poland, uh, they only uh, kind of, you know, gave their stamp that it's official, and the results were uh, were uh, you know accepted in all countries that had the international kennel club that were members of the international kennel club. So pretty much all of Europe mm-hmm. or most of Europe. Uh, but so the Polish uh, Hunting Association made new. Uh, they made the new uh, competition rules that were more more closely closely related to how it works in practice mm-hmm. in the, in the natural setting. Yeah, and they wanted that. Right now, you have to be a member of the Polish Kennel Club to participate in these competitions. So they wanted uh, they wanted hunters that are members of the hunting association. They didn't want them or if you didn't want to be part of the Polish Kennel Club, because you have to pay a yearly and annual fee, mm-hmm. they wanted that to be removed since all members of the hunting association should be able to participate in competitions that they organize regardless of their membership in a kennel organization. Right. But okay. obviously yeah. they, they didn't uh, agree, so they didn't accept the new... Uh, the new regulations, the new competition plans. And uh, in return, the Polish Hunting Association canceled all competitions uh, for an indeterminate indeterminate amount of time. And right now, each organization is trying to organize themselves to make their own competitions. (laughs) So they're training their own judges and they're... um, trying to make a calendar for new events separately okay so we'll see how how it's going to turn out (laughs) but right now uh, we can't do anything about it what a pain what a pain that is and another interesting thing another interesting thing that happened recently is a very controversial move uh where the polish hunting association will allow mixed breeds or breeds that are not, you know, not in any 
registered in any organization to participate in their competitions. Okay. Wow. So you know how it is in Europe where people are crazy about the purity of their breed and papers. So oh, sure. it, it, uh, <laughs> it's a very country. It's a very hot topic right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that. They, it is funny how people get really bent out of shape about stuff like that. I had, um, I had a, uh, yeah, so many people commented when I got a mixed breed hound, you know, just like, just out of the blue. We're just like not, they were just not about it, which is totally fine, but it was, you know, it, it struck me as kind of funny how upset people got about it. You know, and I've got, I've got a friend who's just done a really cool breeding, um, that he's really excited about, but he's almost afraid to tell anybody about it. Cause he's, you know, he's just like aware that he's just, it's a mixed breed. Uh, and he's aware that he's just going to get the crap beat out <laughs> on, on social media. Are you talking about uh, Eric Partolo or? No, 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 no. Eric, Eric doesn't care. <laughs> Eric, Eric doesn't care what other people th think about what he does with his hounds. No, he's uh, Eric has always done his own thing uh, with his with his hounds and, and has created something that is so irrefutably good that it, it's hard to argue with the guy. You know, like. I'm sure when he first did it, he got a lot of crap for it. You know, I, in fact, I know that he did, but you know, at this point, those dogs are so good that it's, it's, it's just impossible to, to dispute that the, that he, yeah, knows, knows what he's doing. Um, yeah, I remember in the episode with, uh, with the guru of small game, Kevin Murphy. Yeah. He was also really impressed with uh, Eric's dogs. Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to be, really. You know, they're just, they're such quality, they're such quality animals. And they're so good. I mean, they're so good at what they do. And, you know, they and Eric work so well together that it's hard to dispute the results that they get. And it's hard to, you know, hard to you know, hard to say that what he's doing, that he shouldn't be doing what he's doing because his dogs are putting, you know, consistently putting as many animals on the ground as uh, anybody else that I know. Um, and I, I know quite a few people at this point. So, um, no, he it's... Did, uh... Go ahead. He, um, he told me that uh, the choices for breeding he, he made uh, were because of the uh, wolf situation in Norway. Uh, well, he's over in Sweden, but but yeah, there ah, was a, there was an issue where uh, a lot of the hounds in his area were kind of getting munched by by the wolves there, and he needed something that was he it was either to stop you know. It was either to stop completely or, or get something that was not going to immediately be killed. Um, and he had a, uh, I'm, I'm going to need to get him on the, on the podcast. Uh, we talk about it all the time. I talk to him, you know, almost daily. We talk hounds almost daily. And yet like it's the craziest thing. I've not had him on the podcast on the podcast yet. So Eric, if you're listening to this, I'm, I'm coming for you here. Cause we gotta, we gotta tell the story, but yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Looking forward to it. Yeah. He's a, he's a cool, cool dude with some really cool dogs. Um, but yeah, I think he took a lot of, cra a lot of flack for that early, early on when he did it. But at this point, you know, the, the dogs are just so darn good. It's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to take issue with any of it. Um, it's, it's something to uh, consider, I guess, for me as well, because the, currently the wolf situation in Poland is also a heated topic. Yeah, you've gotten some wolves moving into your into your territory. 
Yeah, recently, just in the middle of March, we've had a series of uh, attacks on livestock. Mm -hmm. um, I believe two times uh, there were just uh, two sheep of two different farmers that were killed. And later there was actually a whole herd killed. There were, I believe, 17 sheep yeah you told and me about it, that that's crazy. yeah 13 that's unbelievable 13 were killed three were injured and one was left uh, uninjured and 12 out of those 13 were actually pregnant so it was a huge loss to the farmer oh yeah wow wow we've never we've never um not never but in the recent history we didn't have wolves in our area but ever since uh, they've became uh, they went on the protective list as an endangered species uh, and you couldn't uh, hunt them or control their population uh, they really their population really exploded and it's becoming an issue with uh, especially in certain areas because here they're just at the tip of their range so they're just expanding into it right especially into the mountains okay but in some of the uh, areas in the east and north where there's primary hunting grounds mm -hmm. there's a big problem with the how much pressure they're putting on uh the deer population the uh, livestock uh, of people even even if dogs are uh, on the outside in a in a kennel, they 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 can or not in the kennel, but you know, yeah, yeah. They I mean, there have been many incidents of dogs being killed on your porch, sure, by by wolves. Yeah, yeah. but unfortunately, it's such a um, pet animal of these activists that it's. Uh, very hard to do anything about it, even though, for example, in Scandinavia, or Slovakia or other surrounding countries, uh, they have a healthy approach and they are able to, you know, reduce the population. Right. Uh, regulate it by, yeah. by hunting and keep it in a, at a proper level because everyone wants wolves in the environment. They're part of the environment. They, I'm happy that, uh, their population grew enough that they're back within their old range, but that population has to definitely be kept uh, within moderation. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's what, you know, what we're talking about is not total extermination. What we're talking about is common sense, common sense, wildlife management. And, you know, at this point, I, I do not believe that it's feasible, even if, even if it was possible, and I don't even know that it is. Um, I don't think it's realistic to expect that we can go back to pre industrial revolution, kind of like pre levels of predators, um, or not even pre, you know, pre we can't go back to the levels of predators that were that were around you know in the united states 200 years ago here you know a thousand years ago you know it's it's just the it's not the ecosystem is not set up for it anymore and you know where you had a balance before you have a very very bad balance now where you know, like in the United States, and I know here in Norway that, you know, one of the one of the things is that they are having bigger and bigger litters because the amount of game that the amount of small game and you know and the ungulates, you know, the 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 deer has increased to such extreme levels because they've been their main predators have been absent from the from the landscape for so long. And if you introduce them back now, you're going to end up with this just extreme boom of super predators that just don't, 
you know, they're, they're not going to read the rules and regulations. They're, they're going to take what's the easiest thing available. And, you know, if I had to choose between taking on a full grown red stag or an elk and the fat Labrador down the street, I would definitely take the fat Labrador down the street. (laughs) Yeah. And as a side effect of the increasing wolf population with some of the older and older hunters and very experienced, you could even say professional driven, uh, hunt, uh, well, hunters or some people who actually, uh, have a pack of dogs, pack of hounds that they, uh, actually, uh, let's say get paid for going to certain areas and, you know, using their pack to push a driven hunt for a hunting club. Mm -hmm. What these people noticed is that as a result, a lot of the, like I said, the main query is wild boar and red deer, but a lot of the wild boar have learned and adapted to the increased predator pressure from the wolves. And there is in the past two years, there has been a huge increase in a lot of the dogs or uh, hounds used for driven hunts or even individual hunts being injured or killed because the wild boar have also adapted and the weak ones have perished and the ones that are able to defend themselves are the real really dangerous ones that are left right it is survival of the fittest and that makes total sense to me that you're then going to have a you know, you're going to have an animal that is, it's like the moose in Alaska. You know, I I can count on my hands the number of times in, since I moved to Norway 15 years ago that I, that I've heard of that a dog has been attacked or that a dog, a, a moose and a dog has run into conflict here in the sense that, you know, outside of actual moose hunting, you know, um, where you know a dog a sled dog team was attacked by a by a moose or something like that but that happens all the time in alaska and it's because of that it's because they've learned that you know the only way to defend themselves is to immediately go on the offensive uh with the wolves and you know that's that's the thing is people people want them back they want it's sort of was it dan flores or Actually, can't remember. I think it was Dan Flores who who coined the term charismatic megafauna, where it's you know it's it's the it's the animal that you know is the poster child for these anti anti hunters who don't I think unfortunately don't fully understand what they are advocating because I don't think anybody's going to be happy to have a pack of wolves, you know, hunting outside the kindergartens. It's just not going to work. Exactly. You know, and exactly. But it's uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing, and it's also interesting to me, you know, the that that it it seems to be a consistent problem, really, wherever they wherever they are. It's a problem that, without really any differences, you know, the hound the hound hunting is different here in Norway versus the United States or versus there in in Poland. Um, you know, the game can be a little bit different. The way we go about it can be a little bit different. But the thing that we that the United States, Norway, and Poland all have in common is an issue with an issue with wolves that manifests itself pretty much in the exact same way, which is pretty interesting. Another issue, or I think that's something that's, uh, that affects only Europe. Although in Scandinavia, I believe you guys don't have it yet, is African swine fever, where uh, we are just here where I live, we're on the edge of where the zones for African swine fever are. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, 
is destroying the it's a virus that's destroying the wild boar population so um keeping my fingers crossed that uh, all my training and the young hound i have <laughs> we will have the opportunity to still hunt wild boar because like i said we're right on the edge african swine fever right uh is expanding into western europe it came from came from the east to us in 2014 from uh the first case was across the border with belarus okay but it's uh it spread uh up to here and from what i've seen it uh, wipes out the population entirely but uh in some of the regions in poland in the east where it hit first what we can see now after let's say five or six years is that the wild boar population is steadily rising so okay luckily it's it's an issue that it seems that you know we have to deal with at the moment but it's not an uh, end to to everything right and it but, sounds yeah, like you've it's an got issue we have to deal with right now right and it sounds like you've got some other some other things moving in that might be interesting to hunt as well. You know, so it'd be really interesting. It's going to be really interesting to hear what happens when you get um, when you get your hound onto some raccoon because it sounds like that's just a matter of time. That's an area I've been actually theory crafting of expanding to because if it's possible and if it's going to be legal then definitely i would love to do it but that's the thing uh, whether someone's going to think about it and whether some the government or whether they're going to make it legal because you know how it is in europe it's uh, every country every state has its own laws and uh, different ideas <laughs> so you can take something good from good and bad from each place but mm. Fingers crossed that they will allow it. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. That is going to be exciting to, to follow. Well, Kuba, we, I think we could keep talking pretty much all night, but it is 11, over 11 o'clock, and you have an infant in your house. So I might let you get some sleep here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. But we could definitely talk the, the night through. Absolutely. I think it's uh, the one of the benefits of being a houndsman is it's just endlessly, endlessly fascinating to talk about hounds. But um, Well, thank you for the invite. Yeah, it's thanks so much for coming on. It's been really interesting to hear how things are done in, in Poland. I don't think, you know, even, even houndsmen, I don't necessarily think would, you know, cons consider that hound hunting is alive and well and in Poland. It's really, really cool to hear. You know, when I found you, uh, through the podcast, it's because, uh, you are unique in the fact that podcasts are mostly an American thing from what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And you've had some European guests and I've seen some, I think all of the European guests, except, uh, obviously from Scandinavia and your podcast, but we're from Germany. So I guess that's something unique <laughs> that we could talk about. Uh, Absolutely. How it's done here. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so much fun for me to talk to guys over here because there, there is a different, there's a different perspective and a different attitude, you know, when you th like, like we sort of started on when with the podcast started, people think of hounds and I think they think of the United States. They think of, you know, they think of the Fox and the hound. They think of, you know, old pickup truck with that bloodhound baying in the backseat, you know, stuff like that. It, it's, it's become such an easily recognizable part of American culture that I think it's really easy for people to forget that, you know, every breed of American hound apart from the plot came from came out of the english coon uh english foxhound and the plot came out of you know the uh, there's 
multiple possibilities of where, you know, the, what breeds went into the plot originally way, way, way back in the 1700s. But, you know, the, the hound culture in the United States is so rich and so, yeah, easily identifiable uh, as American that it's easy to forget that there's been a culture for breeding and hunting hounds in Europe for, you know, 10 times as long as there has been in the United States. It's just not the thing you necessarily think of uh, when you think of hounds. So it's, it's, uh, I'd like to get more uh, European guys on the podcast just because they, you know, I, it's a, it's a different perspective and it's also, there's a, there's a culture and a history there that is so, so rich. And I, I think in a lot of places in Europe, um, you know, England, for example, the, you know, it should almost be a cautionary tale to the United, the houndsmen in the United States that if you're not on your game, they might just take it away from you. Yeah, definitely. Right now, the American conservation or wildlife management model is probably the best in the world. And uh, you got to fight to keep it as it is or more make it even better because it's in the modern day days, it's, it's becoming harder and harder. Yeah. No, it is. Well, I hope to see you one day here for a hunt for some would love good to do that culture <laughs> sightseeing and, and a, i guess a trip to slovakia for that would be fun <laughs> for a hawk band that would be a lot right of fun there. <laughs> all right kuba thanks so much for coming on thanks again and good night good night man i love that sound